That's pretty good, amen? Uh, I, I, love, I love that song. It's a good version of it too. All right. Well, um, we're going to go ahead and jump into it. And as I've mentioned, I'll just say it again. Um, we are not going to get through all of this tonight. I'm sure that we are not. Um, I'm just going to kind of, my, my, my goal, well, we will be done. We'll, we will end by eight o'clock. Um, I'll stick around a little bit. If any of you have like a one-on-one -on -one question you want to ask, uh, you can certainly do that. We'll pick up where we left off <clears throat> next Wednesday. Um, and after I kind of do each little section here, I'm going to try to move through it reasonably quickly. Um, and then we'll take a few minutes for some questions about that before we hit to the next section. And we'll just evaluate how quickly we can move on that. And again, I will add, if you're watching the live stream and you want to text me um, a question, um, unless this group is just lit up on fire, then we'll try to get to maybe some of those. So you got to come in. No, just okay. So, so the outline, uh, the outline for, for what we're going to try to get through the material that you have in your packet that I have prepared uh, runs through basically five points. And as I was praying about, I've preached on Revelation um, and Daniel and prophecy a number of times, and some of those things are available on the church website. Um, but the, the burden that I had for this series was just to kind of look at the, the Great Tribulation specifically. Um, and we're going to ask a couple of questions. We're going to start with this tonight. First, of, The first one is the importance of interpreting the Bible literally. Um, and then a, a lot of the stuff that you hear, the reason there's so much disagreement about what does Revelation mean, what does it say, it boils down to not even so much a, a difference of interpretation, but a difference of the method of interpretation. Is it literal or allegorical or metaphorical? How do we take it? We're going to talk about why I believe that literal interpretation is the correct approach. Uh, number two, then the revelation of Jesus Christ. A reminder that it's not really about all the disasters, all the big fireworks. It's about Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about what I mean by that. Thirdly, then the key events that are prophesied for the Great Tribulation. What does the Bible say the major events of that time period are going to be? And then number four, who are the key players in it? Who are the key movers and shakers that are driving the action um, in that period of time? And then that will really let us ask the last question, which is, so how close are we? Uh, and as we begin to understand what are the major events and who are the major players, then we can start to look at the world around us today and go, oh, I can see these pieces starting to come together. And then, then it gives us this, uh, the ability to sort of start to gauge it. Now, nobody knows when, when this is going to happen. And anyone that tells you that is trying to sell you something, please just go ahead and say amen. amen. <clears throat> and so I'm not doing that. But Jesus did say uh, to his disciples, he said, hey, you can look at a field and see that it's near harvest. You can look at a tree and see that the fruit is about ripe. He said, you ought to be able to look at the signs and understand the lateness of the seasons. And so that is something that we can do. We, might, we cannot say when, but it is appropriate as Christians to understand what the Bible has said and to look and say, boy, the tree is getting ripe. Like, when's it going to be ready for harvest? It's not up to us, but we can see that it is approaching. Okay. So having said all that, then now we're going to start with the first one, the importance of interpreting the Bible literally. Um, and so uh, if you want to fill in those blanks um, in your handouts as we go along, you're welcome to do that or just listen. It was attached to the email that we sent out if you're at home listening and following along. Um, and so this in, importance of interpreting the Bible literally is something that I teach on a lot here at Spokane Baptist Church. And so most of you are regulars here. You know and have heard multiple messages or anecdotes about why this is important. Um, and I would just say this quickly tonight is that I don't believe that those rules for interpreting the Bible are suspended when we get to the book of the Revelation. That the same way we interpret Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Romans and Acts is the same way we interpret the book of the Revelation. There's no reason to pull that apart and go, we're going to handle this one differently. And let's talk about what I mean by literal what we mean by allegorical, and then why it is this way. So literal interpretation, it's written on your handout as well as on the screen. A literal interpretation means that we give every word of the text the same exact basic meaning that would have a normal, ordinary, customary usage. So it doesn't mean that everything is, in that sense, literally true. It just means that it's language. And if you can read or speak or understand language, you are equipped to do literal interpretation, right? So some of you asked me tonight how I was doing, and I said, man, I've been working like a dog. <sighs> Who is confused and thinks that I'm a puppy? <laughs> Nobody. Why? Because you can speak language. You understand that when I said, like a dog, 
that that word like means I'm giving you an example or an analogy of how I have been working. Now, I wish I was working like a dog. My dog lives the life, let me tell you. But um, so compared to cats, I guess. Okay, so the... So that's what literal interpretation means, all right? So it's in contrast, and, and we would just say about literal interpretation that any, it's not to say there aren't spiritual or allegorical meanings to the scripture. It means that those things are built on top of the literal understanding of it. That we must understand what it literally says first, and then we can, sometimes we can get more spiritual insights from that, but it's based on what it actually says, if that makes sense. Secondly, then we have allegorical interpretation, and this one is very popular among, frankly, among like the, the liberals and the people that have a low opinion of the scripture, a low opinion of the Bible, and they, they prefer to read the Bible in an allegorical sense. Allegorical regards the literal sense of the text as just a vehicle for the secondary, more spiritual, or more profound sense. Let me give you an example of how this goes. When I went to college, I went to Seattle Pacific University, um, they were I was required to take some religious courses there. And I remember my very first Bible class at the college level. Um, they didn't start here, but they worked their way there in that class. They said whether or not Jesus literally rose from the dead or not is not the main thing. They said the most important thing is the idea of resurrection, the spiritual values of new life and new birth. And that can sound kind of spiritual, and sometimes Christians get tripped up and they think, well, that sounds like, because obviously, like, the idea of resurrection and spiritual new life, that seems like maybe that's the most important thing. But listen, if Jesus didn't literally rise from the dead, what's our hope for any kind of resurrection based on? What are these allegorical, these, these ideas of new life and new birth? They're just foo-foo ideas based on nothing unless it's based on the fact that Jesus literally did rise from the dead, just like the Bible says. And, and so in an attempt to be spiritual, they destroy any foundation for that spirituality. Does that sort of make sense? Allegorical interpretation is also just super, super dangerous because you can basically make the Bible say anything you want it to say. And I know that because I sat in the classes with those PhDs and watched them do exactly that. And so I know that they're capable of it. So, so let's talk about literal versus allegorical, why that's the way we approach the Bible, and why that extends even into the book of the Revelation. And then I'll take some questions. Number one, literal interpretation goes hand in hand with regarding the Word of God as being an inspired and an errant book. Now, again, I teach on this a lot. It's really the only tenable position for a Bible believer, and Christians for all of Christian history have held to this view of the Scriptures as that it is literally the God-breathed inspired word of God, not just paraphrased, but, but actually what God intended to say. And that's important because again, like my experience at SPU and with uh, the theological liberals is that they will say, well, you know, people were inspired to write the Bible like an artist is inspired to paint a painting. He sees a sunset and then he paints a painting. It's inspired by the sunset, but it's not a photograph. You know, it's, he put his own biases and maybe he likes the color green. And so he added more green into it than was actually in the sunset. And he left out some trees because he has a hard time painting trees. And, you know, it's, there's the influence of the artist in his painting. And they regard the scriptures in that way. And at first you might think, well, what's so dangerous about that? But it turns out anything they don't like about the Bible, well, that was the authors put that. God didn't intend that. That was the people just put that in there. And then all they've done is they just turned the Bible into Swiss cheese, punched out all the parts they don't like. How convenient that all the parts of the Bible that are man-made are the parts they don't like. I mean, what are the odds? <laughs> and the parts that they already agreed with, those parts came from God. Anyway, it's just a, it's not a, it's not the right way to approach it. If we think the Bible is inspired, which I believe it is, the literal in approach to interpreting it is the only way that makes sense. Number two, literal interpretation gives the authority to the author and not to the reader. When, with an allegorical approach, people are often looking at the Bible and they're saying, well, what does it mean to me? Right? But that's the wrong, it's fine to apply the Bible to yourself, you should. <clears throat> but the first question is not, what does it mean to me? The first question is, what does it mean? Not, not how does it make me feel, it's what is God trying to say? We want to understand what is God saying and then we can move onwards for that. And, or how does it apply to me? Right? Does that make sense? All right. Number three, literal interpretation makes the Bible accessible to anybody, not just to the experts. <clears throat> if you can read or understand 
language, then you can understand the Bible with a literal interpretive method because you can just read it and try to understand what it says. Once you start getting into allegory, I mean, how many of you ever took a class in, in high school or in college where they tried to teach you all the metaphors and the, well, you know, the old woman really represents Moses and you're like, I'm not sure I'm smart enough to follow this, right? And, and experts love that kind of stuff because it makes them special, better than you. And so that sometimes that bad spirit comes to the Bible where the experts want to be able to say, well, no, you can't really understand it. Um, and that's a mistake. Literal interpretation says, hey, if you can understand language, you can understand your Bible. And I believe that God's intention was for us to understand the Bible. Else, why write it? Right? right? So, <clears throat> literal interpretation um, is, is good for this as well. Number four, um, allegorical interpretation makes essentially any teaching possible. Once we move into the realm of allegory, there are no hard rules anymore. There's no fence around the understanding. And so we can make this say, and, and people, there are Bible teachers and stuff out there today who take the Bible allegorically and, and they believe that everything in the book of the Revelation happened in 70 AD. And you think, how is that possible? The answer is allegory. <laughs> they say, well, that's, none of that was intended to be taken literally. All of it is just metaphors for, you know, the burning mountain that's thrown into the sea is political turmoil. Like, okay, but if it can be political turmoil, it can be anything you want it to be, right? And so there's just, there's no fence anymore. It's just everybody's opinion now. <clears throat> and then number five, the book of the Revelation is full of figurative language. Of course it is, but it should still be interpreted literally. Now, let me just give you an example of what I mean by, by that. So again, literal doesn't mean that everything is literal. Literal means that we receive it just as normal, ordinary language. So when we see John say, well, I saw something that appeared as, it doesn't mean that what comes next is exactly what it is. What's it mean? It means it appeared as that. He saw something, and with the words that he has, you know, there's, there's many things that he may have seen when he looked into the future, tanks, airplanes, you know, who knows what, meteors, that those words were not, there are no Greek words for that. He would not have been able to, so he said, well, it looked like this, or it appeared as that. And so we believe that he's literally telling us what it looked like and what it appeared as. He sees scenes in heaven. How many of you would like to try to describe an angel? I mean, you go, go read what some of the prophets wrote trying to describe the angels. They're like, hmm, try to sketch it. I dare you. It's not like what you see in the posters. Um, and so, and the key here is that Revelation itself introduces it that way too, as this is in your outline. The key is in the very first chapter where Jesus tells John in verse 19, he says, write the things which thou hast seen. And if, you, and if you'll bear in mind that what Revelation is, is that Jesus says to John, write the things that you have seen. And then this poor guy has got to try to do that, <laughs> right? And so Jesus shows him the things and tells him the things that he wants done. And he's done the best I mean, guided by the Holy Spirit to give us exactly, exactly that. Now, one other example, uh, in, in the first chapter, John sees a vision of Jesus Christ in his glory, right? Which the disciples, three of the disciples saw that on the Mount of Transfiguration. They got a glimpse of Jesus in glory rather than veiled in human flesh, which is mostly how people saw him. And, and he tries to write what Jesus looks like. And it's a wild read. You should go look at it. It's incredible you know, is not the humble carpenter now, right? But one of the things that he says, for example, is that, that Jesus' feet were like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace, right? So now, obviously, Jesus does not have feet made out of brass. Somebody say amen. Obviously not. But, but look at the language here. It's not hard to understand. His feet were like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. So there's something about Jesus' feet that look like brass heated in a furnace. I mean, that's what he saw. And that's, that's pretty wild when you think about it. Um, but does that make sense? And so, and that's the way that we're going to, that's the way I believe that we ought to approach the entire Bible. And I believe that includes, obviously, the book of the Revelation. And so as we work our way through this and understand the things that are in here, my approach is always to just say, well, if that's what it says, then I think it is like that. 
And, and within that, people are going to like disagree and we'll have slightly different interpretations. But a literal, a literal approach puts a fence around how crazy we can get. Everybody with me? Okay. So, so we'll hit pause right there. Anyone have any follow-up questions? So this is obviously a foundational concept. We talk a lot about it in church. Anyone want to shoot out a question about literal versus allegorical interpretation or any concern you have about that? All right. So get to the good stuff, preacher. All right. That's good. So that's foundational. That's awesome. So next we want to talk about the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now you may, some of you have may have picked up on it already <clears throat> that I am kind of a stickler for referring to this book as the revelation, um, which you'll notice if you look in your Bibles that it's not revelations. It's a pet peeve of your pastor when people call this book revelations. And I know why they do it because there's lots of visions in it. There's lots of things that are revealed in it. And so if you catch me on a calm day, I'm not actually that mad about it. But the, the, the proper name for this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And, and the reason I want to hit that with you is that it's important, I think, to bear in mind as we study this book that, that the purpose is not just to catalog all the destruction that's going to happen on the earth. The purpose of it is to prepare us for the glorious return of our God and King, Jesus Christ. He, he promised he is coming back, and every Christian has this hope. Uh, every true follower of Jesus Christ is eagerly anticipating his return. And Jesus, in his ministry with his disciples, and then here through his ministry with the Apostle John on the island of Patmos, is invested in making us know that it's not just going to be smooth sailing between here and there. That, that people are going to like, the enemy is going to try to make us lose heart. He wants us to give up hope. He wants us to despair of his return. And so Jesus said, I'm going to tell you how it's going to go. And it's going to undergird a lot of faith for us. Now, I believe we're going to be gone for the actual great tribulation. We're getting there next. Um, but as we see these things approach and as they build for us, and frankly, for the people who, who go through it, I don't think that's us, but there will be people. But if it is us, like, listen, if it turns out that I'm wrong about that, there's a few people here at church I owe, thank, or I owe apology notes to. <clears throat> but I want the thank you notes if I'm right and we're gone. So, um, <laughs> but, but the point of it all, the point of it all, what we don't want to lose track of is that the purpose of this is the revelation. It's the revealing of Jesus Christ. And that's right there. I'm not making that up. Revelation 1.1 it's literally there on your handout, literally. <laughs> um, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And so this book then goes on to span the history of the church, really beginning right there in the first century, all the way through to the end. Okay, so, so if this is all about the second coming of Christ, let's ask a question. And the question is this, when Jesus comes, are we going to meet him in the clouds or are we going to meet him on the Mount of Olives? When Jesus comes back, to where does he come? Does he return to the clouds or does he return to the Mount of Olives? <laughs> oh man, smart Alec in the back, but he's got the right answer. Nice. All right. Good job. Nice. So let's look at two Bible verses and then we'll try to answer this question. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Say, so, well, boom. Those of you who are thinking, well, we meet him in the clouds. You're feeling pretty smug right now. Jesus comes back in the clouds. We go meet him there. All right. Let's look at another Bible verse. Zechariah 14.4. And his feet, the Messiah, Jesus, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the mountain of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west. So there's a, there's a number of Bible prophecies that talk about this, that pinpoint the Mount of Olives as the place of Christ's return. And when he sets his foot down on that mountain, so he left from there up into the clouds. And when he returns from there and sets his foot down on that mountain, it's going to be so heavy, he's going to split that mountain in two. <laughs> it's going to be, I can't wait. It's going to be great. Um, so, so you say, okay, well what, well, what is it? 
And the answer is, now there are no contradictions in the Bible. Somebody just say amen or I'll preach on that for a minute. Okay, there's no contradictions. What, what's going on here? What's going on is there are two different events. The Bible's talking about two completely separate events. And if you make a careful study of the Bible verses that talk about this, it becomes evident very quickly that these are two events. And I've outlined them along with scripture verses here. There's more, but this is a, this is a good enough sampling, I think. So what we tend to do for the sake of clarity, um, what like committed Bible believers tend to do, is we refer to the second coming as the event where Jesus literally sets foot back on the earth again be the first time when the physical foot of Jesus touches the earth again. That's the second coming. The first coming in a manger. Second coming, Mount of Olives, right? Those are the two comings of Christ. But there's another event that happens in between those, evidently, and we tend to call that one the rapture. Now, the word rapture does not appear anywhere in your Bibles, but in this First Thessalonians verse, it says, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together, that caught up together, if that was in Latin, is rapturos, right? So rapture is literally a catching up, which is exactly what 1 Thessalonians says. So that's where that, the term rapture comes from, 1 Thessalonians 4. It's the catching up or the catching away of the followers of Christ. So and if, as we look at these events, they become clear, very distinct. The, in the green, you can see the rapture verses. In the blue on your handout, you can see the second coming verses. In the rapture, you'll notice the saints are taken to heaven. If you look at the second coming, you'll see that the saints come with Jesus on horses behind him as a part of the armies of God. And it says, and behind him are the saints and the armies of heaven. So in one, the saints go up to meet him. And in one, the saints come back with him. During the rapture, there's no indication at all that the earth is judged. There's no judgment specifically on the earth. However, at the second coming, the earth is judged. That's the final winnowing. It's Jesus wipes out the uh, armies of the Antichrist and the armies of the world. Uh, the rapture is described as being imminent, instant, and signless. The instruction to Christians is, be ready. Yeah. You, you know not when the master cometh. And at any moment, Jesus could be here. And, 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 I, and I say this, um, that I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. Yeah. Like my, 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 my hope is not that I'm going to get buried and go see Jesus, although that will be just fine. My hope is that I'm going to get raptured and go see Jesus and just nobody will have to come to my funeral and find potato salad. All right. <laughs> The second coming, in contrast to being instant and signless and that we're something we're supposed to be anticipating at any moment, the, the second coming follows definite signs and timing. Uh, I would argue that the second coming, that Jesus' foot on the Mount of Olives, that you could set your watch by it based on the timing of the peace treaty with Israel and based especially on the abomination of desolations, which we'll get to maybe in a moment. But the Bible tells us in Daniel and in Revelation that there's three and a half years between these events. And so... So if the second coming, we know, we don't know when the clock is going to start ticking, but when it does, we know how long until the second coming occurs. That sort of makes sense. So it's a, that separates it from the rapture as an event. Also, the rapture affects only the believers. The believers go up. When the second coming happens, the entire wor world is affected. The, every eye will see him, the Bible says. Um, and then the rapture, Christ comes in the clouds for his bride. And in the second coming, he comes to earth, to the Mount of Olives, with his saints. And so that's, <clears throat> there's just more verses that talk, deal with those things. So, they're clearly separate events. Any serious Bible scholar will agree that they're separate events. Where you start to get some disagreement among people that love Jesus and love their Bibles and take it seriously is how far apart are these two events, right? And, and you, have, you have Christians that I expect to see in heaven and say, nah, 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 nah I was right too. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Jesus is going to fix all these rough parts of me when I get to see him. But um, uh, there are Christians who think that the rapture immediately precedes the second coming. That in other words, we go up to meet with Jesus, jump on a horse and come right back with him. That it happens just like that. There's some that believes it's separated by the three and a half years. That it happens right before the abomination of desolations. There's a three and a half year chance to learn to ride a horse, and then you come. And then there are people like me who believe it precedes the seven-year tribulation. I don't know by how much. I want to talk to you a little bit about that, and then we'll take more questions again. I'll give you the chance for it. So the question is, okay, when, when will the rapture happen? And that, the answer to that is September 20... No, I'm just teasing. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, 
again, I believe the Bible teaches very clearly that the rapture is imminent, so any time, but it is instant and signless. Part of the reason I believe the rapture happens first is that I believe there are no signs that are necessary to precede the rapture. I, uh, the Bible seems to indicate that the apostles, that the first century Christians were expecting the rapture to happen. They were ready, they were ready for the trumpet to blow and go. And Christians have certainly been waiting for it um, ever since. So, so let's look at a couple of reasons why I think the rapture occurs first. Firstly, I believe that the best reading of the scriptures, the best understanding of what the Bible tells us about this, is that the Antichrist will not arise until the Holy Spirit, and therefore the church, is taken out of the way. And so let's look at the Bible verse that, that says this, and we'll just talk about it. It says, for the mystery of iniquity, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, 2 through 9, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And in other places, the Bible repeats this. The spirit of Antichrist is already present in the world. How many of you have turned on a TV and know that that's true? Yeah. The spirit of Antichrist is already in the world and has been since Jesus. The, 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 there have been false Christs and false messiahs and just this, that spirit is already here. So the Bible says that again, the mystery of iniquity doth already work and says only he who now letteth, now let is an unfortunate English word that from the time the King James Version was written to now has changed what it means. When we say let in English now, mostly we mean allow, but let originally meant to restrain or withhold. And if you look at it in the Greek, that's in fact, the Greek word that's there is to restrain or hold back. Um, and so we still use let a little bit that way in English. There are edge cases, but just understand that when it says only he that letteth means restrains. He that restrains will let or will restrain until he be taken out of the way and then shall the wicked one be revealed. Now, even if you don't know the Greek, it's obvious that let here means hold back just from the way it's used, right? Because he'll continue to let until he's taken out of the way and then the wicked one will be revealed. So this verse is not ambiguous. It's clear. So what does that mean? The spirit of Antichrist is already at work in the world. The devil would like to produce the Antichrist, produce a false Christ that can deceive as many people as possible. But something is restraining that from happening. There is something that is hindering this from going on. What is that? It is he that letteth that's going to be taken out of the way. There are two interpretations for this. Some people believe that it means the church, that we are the ones that are restraining it because we know better. Because if the Antichrist arose now, we would all be like, no, no, no. You understand that number 666? Do you know what that means? Right? And so that we are restraining it by the fact that we have our Bibles and know what it says. I think the best, that's possible. I think the best understanding is that the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is restraining this from happening. He's preventing it from occurring. And then when the Holy Spirit is removed, then the Antichrist will be revealed. And you say, I want you to know that until Pentecost, the Holy Spirit did not guarantee and dwell every single believer. Most, for the entire Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon people, would come upon the kings and then depart, would come upon the prophet and then depart. So it's, it's very different. And Jesus did extensive teaching on this and the Acts covers it extensively. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God was only made possible by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Jesus said, it's expedient for me that I go away, that I might send the comforter to you. So the Holy Spirit's presence is in the world now in a unique and special way because of Jesus Christ. But this verse indicates in 2 Thessalonians that, that that presence of the Holy Spirit in our world is restraining the Antichrist. Once the Holy Spirit is removed, then the man of sin will be revealed. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can see that here in the verse. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the workings of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. This is very clearly the Antichrist, the, the person that we identify as the Antichrist. And so, so then the follow-up question to that is, can the church be here without the Holy Spirit? Obviously not. The, what makes you a Christian? I mean, like Jesus said, if you have not the Spirit, you have not God, right? So, we, if you don't, you cannot be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. The two things, they, they go together axiomatically. So either the church is restraining and we're going to go and that'll let the Antichrist be revealing or the Holy Spirit is the one that's restraining and when he goes, we got to go with him. Wherever the Holy Spirit goes, that's where I'm going. Amen? Okay. 
So, so I believe that based on this verse and some other teachings, that the best understanding is that the rapture occurs before the Antichrist is revealed. So before the tribulation really kicks off. Number two, part of being saved is being delivered from God's wrath. When, when you get saved, part of that whole idea of getting saved is that the wrath of God is poured out on Christ on Calvary instead of poured out on you. <clears throat> Romans 5, 9, much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and we wait for his son, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. And the Bible's filled with things like this. But the tribulation is a period of God's wrath poured out onto the earth. And so it's very difficult to imagine how you could have Christians present on the earth while the wrath of God is being poured onto the earth. Uh, Revelation 16.1, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways, pour the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Now, there are workarounds for this. There are Christians that love Jesus and love their Bibles that say, well, the wrath of God doesn't, those vials don't get poured out until after the abomination of desolation. It's not until the second half of the tribulation. So that means you could put the tribulation or the rapture into the middle. And, and fair enough. That's, that's, a reasonable, that's a reasonable interpretation of that. Some will say, well, even though we're here for it, we're like spared from it. But when you read the judgments that are poured on the earth, I mean, nobody is spared in that sense, really, from it. From the worst of it, maybe, but... So again, I believe the best understanding of what the scriptures teach on this is that we are delivered from wrath, therefore we cannot be here for the tribulation. If I'm wrong, I'm making friends with the people that have stockpiled guns and ammo. Okay, number three. <laughs> the, tribulation, the tribulation is primarily about Israel. It's fascinating. It's fascinating as you read what the Bible says about the end times, how almost almost, I believe, pointedly excludes talking about anything other than Israel. Even as you read the book of the Revelation, you'll see that it begins with letters to seven churches. And so it talks about the church, the church, the church, the church. You get to chapter four, and the word church never shows up again. The terminology completely switches to saints, which is a different thing, because like that's the word the Bible uses for like the Old Testament saints, the people that didn't know the name of Jesus, that weren't, that weren't immersed into the Holy Spirit. And so it goes back to just dealing with the nation of Israel. And most of the Old Testament prophecies talk about God's dealings with the nation of Israel. And so, so again, I believe the best understanding of this is the rapture happens first because the intent of the tribulation period is to deal with Israel and then to a lesser extent, just the sins of the whole world. Uh, and then number four, Christ promised the church victory over Satan. Jesus said, in 1 John 4, 4, uh, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's a great Bible verse, amen? How many of us are glad that that is true? That as, as people of Christ, as possessors of the Holy Spirit of God, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. So we're overcomers, right? But in Revelation 13, verse 7, it says, and it was given unto him, to the Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So you say, well, is greater than he that is in us than he that's in the world? So how is he that's in the world able to overcome these tribulation saints? And the answer is, I believe, because they don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit anymore. It's back to an Old Testament system where people are going to come to trust Christ um, during the tribulation period, just like people trusted in Christ looking forward to the Messiah in the Old Testament, but that did not get them the Holy Spirit. That they, they were not a part of Christ's church in that Old Testament. Um, it's really, really special to be a part of the church. It's really, really special. And I, it's one of the reasons I don't like people that kind of minimize or devalue church because this is a very cool thing. It's Christ's church that we get to be a part of. Um, and so, so those would be my four arguments for why I believe that the rapture happens first. Um, and then I believe there's some, I believe there will be some kind of a gap that doesn't start the tribulation. The seven year tribulation does not start the day after the rapture. Um, and there's lots of Bible precedent for that. Um, Noah goes onto the ark and it's a week before the rain starts. There's a gap between, and if you just kind of imagine the amount of chaos that an event like the rapture, if every Christian around the world disappeared in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, it might take a while for the world to get its feet back under it. 
but it might be exactly the thing that, because the Bible says that right once he that restrains is removed, then the wicked one will be revealed. It seems to me that the rapture is the perfect opportunity for the Antichrist to consolidate the power that he needs to get the leverage over the world system that he needs, and that that will, in fact, he'll be revealed as this one that was prophesied, and he'll do that out of the chaos created by the events of the rapture. That's, 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 I believe that that is the best reading of those Bible verses on that. Um, Let's take questions about that. I got charts that might help me depending on what questions I get. Or if we don't have questions, we can start talking a little bit more about the tribulation specifically uh, before we're done. 748 right now. Anybody got a question about, about that? Yes, sister. Right. Great. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that? Sure. So the question was... She's referencing, there's a Bible verse where it says all of Israel will be saved. I, I believe that's in Romans. I think it's mentioned in the Gospels also. And, and that is the event, all of Israel being saved, is the one that actually precedes the second coming. So that, the idea is, is that, you, I already mentioned that the tribulation is primarily about Israel. And the idea is, so these are God's people. He called Abraham. He made lots of promises to Abraham that have not yet been fulfilled. And God is going to fulfill them. But many of, the, many of the covenants that God made with Israel are conditional. God said, if you do this, then I will do this. And if you do that, then I will do this. So in order to fulfill some of these promises, Israel's got to, he has to drive ungodliness, the Bible says, out of the house of Jacob. And, and they have rejected their Messiah. So the Bible says that one day, though, that Israel nationally, and that doesn't necessarily mean 100%, but nationally. Because again, Israel rejected Christ. Many Jews believed him, right? The disciples were all Jews, and the whole first church was all Jewish people. But nationally, as a whole, they rejected Christ. The reversal of that needs to happen, where nationally, they're going to they're gonna look on him who they've pierced and acknowledge him as their Messiah. And when they do that, he comes to rescue them. He comes, he destroys all of their enemies, and then fulfills all the promises made to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob. So we're, but that, it's actually a lot, a lot of the point of the tribulation is it's seven years to make it so bad that, that the nation of Israel will finally say, we rejected our true Messiah. We accepted a false one. We'd like to change our minds, please. <laughs> and when they, and when they do nationally, then Jesus returns and saves them. Does that sort of, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Excellent. And again, that's another reason why, because the focus of these things really is the nation of Israel, as far as God's dealings on the earth goes, that's one of the reasons why that's true. Other questions about that, about the rapture specifically? Was that in the timeline? Right before the second coming. Armageddon, Armageddon is specifically the event that prompts Israel to look on him whom they've pierced. <clears throat> because they're out of, they're, their supposed savior has betrayed them. And all the nations of the, all the armies of the world have come to invade. Literally, the armies of the world are, are assembled in the valley of Megiddo and ready to wipe Israel off the map. And, and then they, there's a national repentance. Christ comes on a white horse, us with him. Woohoo! Let's go! We don't get to do any fighting. Jesus wipes them all out before we can get our swords out. But he comes and wipes out the armies of the world and saves them. Yeah. Was there, did I see a hand? It's like an auction here. If you scratch your nose, you might buy something. Yeah, do you, well, then the thousand-year reign, be thousand reign begins. There's a period of cleanup, which is interesting. The Bible does actually. The Bible gives us the timeline for that because they got to clean up all the dead bodies and rebuild a bunch of stuff, and then the thousand year starts after that. Yeah, good question. Yes. Matthew okay. Yes. Now, that's tribulation. Yeah. Obviously, that means we, some will be here during the first half of the tribulation. So, and we, we can talk, I'll, I'll give you, there's a more detailed answer to this question. I'll give you the short one, and then we can talk a little bit more after, if, you, if you'd like to. But, <clears throat> but, but Matthew 24, um, I believe, is Christ addressing the nation of Israel. 
not, not, not the church. And so when he says, don't go, you know, if you, when you see the abomination of desolation happens, Matthew 24, Jesus says, don't go into your house to get your coat. If you're in the field, don't go back to your house. When you see this occur, get to the hills. Go, go, go right now. Don't go back for any reason because at that point, destruction on parallel is about to happen, right? That's what you're, that's the passage you're talking about. Right. Yeah. But further down it says, and then shall be great tribulation. Right. Such as not since. Not since the beginning. Yeah, exactly. So the, the metaphor that Christ uses here and in multiple places that the Bible presents for the great tribulation is pregnancy. And so it's like the second coming of Christ is compared to like the birth of a child. And the contractions, you know, in pregnancy, they, they start out mild and re reasonably far apart. And, they, and then, and, you know, you get excited. You're like, oh, we're having a baby. And, and, you, and the doctors say, don't come in yet. Stay at home for a few more hours. Wait until the contractions are more intense and closer together. And I can't remember what the time is. It's been seven years <laughs> since we went through this. But then they, they get more and more intense and closer and closer together. And you see that through the seals and then the trumpets and into the bowls. So in the most technical sense, the great tribulation takes place in the last three and a half years. I would agree with that. That's correct. So, 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 it is, so there, is a, there is a for sure reasonable position that Christians take that the rapture happens just before the great tribulation of the last three and a half years. And I, and I find that to be a biblically acceptable position. Um, but, I, but I believe that we're spared all of the tribulation, not just the last half of it, for the reasons I outlined. But, but, I, but I, and partly because I think that Christ is talking to the nation of Israel in Matthew 24, not necessarily to the church. And I can give you the reasons for that later. Yeah. If it was that, and I used to be a church. Yeah, yeah, my dad was a big mid-tripper for a long time, yeah. Then you would know what the rapture was. And, right. And we're not supposed to know what it is. The problem is... You'd be able to know the one of, one of the problems is, is that you could see, okay, now, now we know when the rapture is going to come, and that seems that causes some problems with a bunch of other scripture verses. Is you could say, you could say well, it's going to happen a few days before or something like that, and so you can build some fuzziness into it. There are some workarounds on it, but not my not my preferred understanding of it. <laughs> but good good question. Any others here? Before we yeah, brother David. Okay, yeah. Good question. So David has another question about Matthew chapter 24. When he was in the, briefly, in with the Jehovah's Witnesses, this is one of the passages that they really like to use. A lot of the cults like to use Old Testament stuff because it's a little bit more, it's less clear often. Again, what David's talking about, so because like one of the things that Christ says in Matthew 24 is they that endure to the end shall be saved. And, and he also, Jesus talks about the separation of the sheep and the goats based on what they've done, based on their works. And the, the ones with the good works get to go in, and the ones with the bad works stay out. Did you give me a cup of cold water in my name? And those things are all in there. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I believe that this is, this is an, basically an Old Testament thing, that he's talking to, to Jewish people. And that what's in view, if you study it carefully, and maybe because we're running a little bit out of time here, it's almost 8, I promised you I'd be done at 8. So next Wednesday, next Wednesday I'll do this. I'll come with a little bit more on Matthew chapter 24, since it's something people are interested in, which is, which is wonderful. But I, be, I believe, to answer David's question, what's in view of Matthew 24? If you go read it and you go see what you think, that it's about, it's about the millennial reign. That Jesus is driving towards who gets, because not, not everybody dies during the tribulation. You know, when you read through the revelation, you'll see that a third in the sea die and a third in the land die. And, and then again, a whole third of the earth is wiped out. And so, I mean, the population of the earth is brought very, very low, but not everybody dies. And then when Christ comes, he kills all the armies of the world in the Valley of Megiddo, but not, you know, that's not everybody. And so the, of the surviving people, who gets to live in, in the new millennial kingdom that gets set up on the earth? And the answer to that question, I believe, is in Matthew chapter 24. But that's what that's about. And it is a workspace judgment on who gets to go in and who, and who is not allowed to go into that kingdom. 
Um, but that's not salvation. Those people still need to make a decision for or against Christ. And you see at the end of the millennium that there are people as uncountable as sand on the, on the sea that have rejected God even at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ that would rather have their own way than Christ's uh, and rebel against him at the end of the millennium. Um, so, and I believe that's, that's how we get to that. Like, where did those people, where did those rebels even come from? And the answer to that, again, is Matthew chapter 24. So that's, I'll prepare some more for that for, ne for next Wednesday. We can deep dive a little deeper in it. But there was another question over here, sister. We got two minutes. And you talked about people that may be saved during the tribulation. Yeah. Okay, so she asked if I would talk a little bit about people that may be saved during the tribulation. I believe many people are going to get saved during the tribulation. Let me just throw um, a chart up here. Um, I think I've got it. No, I don't have it here. Okay, never mind. Um, the, um, it's in the slide deck later, but we don't have time to go digging for it. So one of the things that happens very early in the Revelation is that God seals 144,000 Jewish people for his service. And that's another thing that Jehovah's Witnesses tried to like say, well, that's going to be us. And, but they went way over 144,000 in their world, in their membership. And, and that's just the beginning of problems with the Jehovah's Witnesses. But, but the 144,000 that are sealed, I mean, we're told which tribes of Israel they're from. They're clearly, they're clearly ethnically Jewish. The, the Bible says which tribes they belong to. So those 144,000 are sealed as witnesses to basically be spreading the gospel to let people know that I mean, there, is, there is a voice. And at, at some points in the Revelation, God even sends angels to fly through the heavens and to warn people not to take the mark of the beast. Um, and so there, there are, and all the, all the Bibles are going to get left. You know, I mean, you know, there's going to be lots of people that are going to get, they're going to get the message uh, either from the Jewish witnesses or from the angels or from picking up a Bible or there's lots of people that you and I have witnessed to that, you know, like one of my, one of my deep, deep fears, something that I labor enormously about is I don't want anybody to show up to church here the Sunday after the rapture happens. Right. <laughs> you know, because like I want everybody here to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want anyone that, that came to church here that didn't get saved, but there will be people that went to churches and heard about Christ, but never received him. And the rapture is going to happen. And some of them are going to, they're going to have, you still did them a favor by sharing the gospel with them because they've got a head start maybe on believing it. The Bible warns us there's going to be strong delusion, which I will actually talk about a little bit. Um, so it's not a good idea to hedge your bets. To say, well, if everybody disappears, then I'll get saved. Like that's not, yeah, you're, yeah. It's, Plus, you don't want to be alive. You don't want to, you know, you're not going to be able to buy or sell. And they're going to be hunting you to behead you. And it's not going to be a good time to be um, a follower. But is that, is that, was that the answer to your question? Okay. So people, people will for sure still get saved. It's going to be very difficult. If you get saved, or, or not even saved. Saved is maybe not the right word. If you become a follower of God, if you reject the Antichrist uh, during the tribulation, you're going to have a very hard time. With it. Most of those people are going to die. And we get, a, we get a view of them, the souls under the altar, and they say, God, how long are you going to let this go on before you put a stop to it? Because it's going to be egregious what's going to be done. Um, so, um, but, but, that, but there, there will still be a witness. God, does not, God never leaves the world without a witness. So that will happen. And even the two witnesses, there's another one. The two witnesses will, will preach and prophesy. There's the alarm going off. Tell me it's 8 o'clock. Not keeping my word. Okay. There's a couple of charts there that you can look at. Um, I'll just kind of tell you briefly what they are and then I'm going to pray. This is, uh, if you take the Bible literally, uh, you will come up with a dispensational interpretation uh, of the scriptures. And, and all that is to say is that basically there's different eras of human accountability and the end of judgment. As people fail the different levels of accountability that God gives us. We can talk more about that if you're interested. There's a basic diagram of, of what I believe is going to happen. Christ. First coming, start the church age. Church age ends with the rapture. The seven-year period of tribulation of Jacob's trouble. That ends with the second coming, which launches the millennium. I believe there are a little slight gaps in there, but that's basically what it's going to look like. The church age, which we live now, looks like this. That's the first three chapters of Revelation where it goes into seven churches, which was not clear to the early Christians, but is increasingly clear now that those aren't just the seven kinds of churches, which they are. Those are the seven kinds of churches. In Spokane today, 
you can find one of every single kind of these churches. They, they all exist right now in Spokane and everywhere in the world. But as it's gone on through history, it's become apparent that Jesus gave these churches in order of the dominant spirit of the age of those churches, which is really fascinating as you watched as history. We, it's only visible now looking back that those seven churches represent sort of seven eras in church history as you move through them. And it's outlined there with the dates of broad, broadly how that went along. Really a fascinating thing. It's a little kind of hidden bit of prophecy that's one of those things that gives us confidence that we're approaching the end because the last two sort of church ages are existing simultaneously. And, and Philadelphia is in many ways, it's come to a close in the West. It still exists in uh, Asia. Um, but we'll see what happens here in Asia with the rise of China and stuff. If, it, if Philadelphia sort of comes to a close there, that could be, that could be it. So, all right, I gotta pray. I'm gonna hang out here for a couple more minutes. If you got something, you just cannot wait till next Wednesday. Uh, you come talk to me. You send me an email. You can send me a text message. I never did look at my phone. Sorry, live streamers. Um, oh, I did get a couple of messages. Oh, that was just from Pastor Jamie saying, good job. Thanks, brother. All right, so let's go ahead and pray and we'll be done here. Okay. God, we just thank you again for tonight. Thank you for all these folks that have uh, come to be a part of this and tuned in on the live stream. And uh, Lord, we um, mostly, mostly, we are just excited to see you, God, face to face. Uh, and Lord, we are, so conf we are so grateful that you shed your blood on an old rugged cross to make that possible. And Lord, we, we yearn for that day when you come, but we, we recognize, Lord, that the work around us is great. And so I pray that, Lord, as we read these things, we would not be discouraged or frightened but that we would be motivated, God, to stick by the stuff, to stick close to you, and to continue about the work of things that are eternally important. We recognize that all these things are going away. And that the only thing that lasts and that's eternal is our relationship with you and the souls of the people around us. So God, help us to be invested in that eternal work until that day when you come as the great king of glory, which we know that you are, until that day, help us to be close to you. We ask it in Jesus' name.